I don't have to show you here. I don't have a copy of the Liverpool guidebook to show you. But I do have a guidebook called Walks in London. And so I'm going to just take a few moments before we go into the discussion to give you a few London sites just to get some idea of what these guidebooks may have looked like to, uh, to Redburn. And the first guidebook I'm going to show you, or the first page, is this illustration. I'll zoom into the illustration and then focus it. This is Dr. Johnson's chair at St. John's Gate. And here we have a crypt of St. John's at Clerkenwell. Now this is a London guidebook. And I'll show you some scenes that you might... Here we have the tomb of Sir John Crosby. Remember when Wellingborough goes into, uh, uh, when, when Harry Bolton goes into either the gambling house or the, the, uh, the brothel, where there's a statue whose ear he whispers into. And every time he whispers in the ear, servants come or people come with food and drink. And he mentions that... <coughs> The figure sits he mentions that the figure is particularly designed and sits on a pedestal and there you have Saint Helena on a on a pedestal. This happens to be a scene from Aldgate in 1878 in London in this guidebook. And remember, he sees a gate in Liverpool which only has, which is only partially intact. And here we have the Gate of the Dead at Seething Lane. But these guidebooks have a lot of text. They tell you who lived there. Who's supposed to live there? You get some pictures. Just one more of the Tower of London. This is a London, a, a, again, a London guidebook, not Liverpool. But there you've got Byward Tower, Traitor's Gate, these are scenes that Melville himself might have looked at. He went to London six separate times. Uh, to sell his books and to make sure that his publishers in London were, had the text they needed to help support uh, his publishing enterprise. And so he was familiar with these scenes and may have even seen them himself. Just a few more scenes of London in this particular guidebook. Here, let's look at the George Inn in Southwark. And one more guidebook. This is a book called The Book of the Cheese. Let me show you this. Believe it or not, The Book of the Cheese. This is a complete study of the Cheser Cheese Restaurant. Now, mind you, this is not part of Redburn, so don't, don't, don't write in your examination that Redburn or Melville or Redburn uh, visited the Cheshire Cheese. It's possible that Melville visited the Cheshire Cheese because the Cheshire Cheese restaurant, which existed at the same time of, as Johnson and, and where Johnson's club met, uh, has kept its decor exactly the same as in the 18th century, and you can go there today within walking distance of St. Paul's Cathedral and see this particular restaurant. So this is another guidebook, a few scenes from the Cheshire Cheese. And let me just uh, 
Okay, let's have this. This is the room in the Cheshire Cheese where Johnson's portrait is on the wall and the table at which Johnson sat. Um, if you look, uh, you look at this last picture, if you're moving toward St. Paul's Cathedral, you see, you move toward St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, the Cheshire Cheese restaurant is on your left. Excuse me, Dr. Rothman, are those, this may be a dumb thing to ask, but are those um, photographs or are those etchings or, I can't, I can't tell from, from the... Uh, the ones I'm showing you are photographs. Excuse me. Uh, no, they're paintings that have been engraved. Okay. Right. That's right. And most of them, they, they seem to be, these have been engraved, although this would be, well, this is probably a portrait that had been engraved for this book. Right. At any rate, these become a few guidebooks to look at, just as Wellingbert had, had looked at them, and you get some idea what's happening. Now, what I'd like to do at this point is focus on some of the characters that we find in Redburn. After this, we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at what Redburn thinks about slavery, and then we're going to move on to the Greases, where we'll look at his view of government and religion and economics and the aspects of art that are mentioned in this book. Obviously, Redburn is not just the book of a young boy going to see. Redburn is the book is a story really of an individual who gives us insight into Melville's brain. And because a lot of the book is autobiograph autobiographical, we also understand how a writer gains the experience that leads him into his art. Now, the page numbers here do not correspond to the ones you have, but I will try to get you to the chapter and mention to you what's happening here. Zoom back out. At the end of the novel, Redburn is accompanies Harry Bolton to Captain Riga to collect his pay. And we discover that he had worked four months at three dollars a month for three three dollars a month. He was supposed to get twelve dollars. But Riga charges him for some tools that fell overboard that he was had in his hands. And then when Harry and Redburn left Liverpool to London. Riga considers them to have deserted, and so he feels that Redburn has forfeited his $12. So in the end, Riga demands $7 from Redburn that he owes him. And Redburn, of course, says he's bankrupt, he can't do anything about it. He throws up his hands and leaves. Now, one of the things that Redburn was very proud of was that his great uncle had been in the American Revolution. And what does Riga do? Riga cuts him down by saying, oh, yes, your great uncle, wasn't he a barber or something? In other words, he finds an occupation which is really mundane and indifferent and certainly not as heroic as fighting in the American Revolution, attributes to his uncle these characteristics and uh, attempts to embarrass Redburn. Well, at that point, we realized that Riga, who attracted Redburn, whom Redburn thought was going to be a father figure, is self-serving and selfish. <laughs>
let's look at Jackson and get some idea of what kind of person Jackson is. And I'd like to look at some of the phrases and put them in Melville's words, because Melville's far more eloquent than I am on this situation. Turn to chapter 22. And about five chapters, five paragraphs from the end, we have Jackson, who is the incarnate devil, the devil incarnate, saying this. Don't talk of heaven to me. You see that chapter begins, and did you get out of the, and did you get that out of your silly dream book, you Greek? How Jackson threw a cough. You see that? It's at the end of chapter 22. And did you get that out of your silly dream book? The last words of the chapter are... You got it? All right. Don't talk of heaven to me, says Jackson. It's a lie. I know it. And there are... They are all fools that believe in it. Do you think, you Greek, that there's any heaven for you? Will they let you in there with that tarry hand and that oily head of hair? Avast, when some shark gulps you down his hatchway one of these days, you'll find that by dying, you'll only go from one gale of wind to another. Mind that, you Irish cockney, yes. You'll be bolted down like one of your own pills, and I should like to see the whole ship swallowed down in the Norway maelstrom. Every day, this Jackson seemed to grow worse and worse, both in body and mind. He seldom spoke, but to contradict, deride, or curse this negativism. And all the time, though his face grew thinner and thinner, his eyes seemed to kindle more and more as if he were going to die out at last and leave them burning like tapers before a corpse. This essence of evil. The next paragraph, it continues. Though he had never attended churches and knew nothing about Christianity, no more than a Malay pirate, and though he could not read a word, yet he was spontaneously an atheist and an infidel, and during the long night watches would enter into arguments to prove that there was nothing to be believed, nothing to be loved, and nothing worth living for. Now that is the essence of evil. If ultimately you discover that there is nothing to be believed, nothing to be loved, and nothing worth living for, but everything to be hated in the wide world, he was a horrid desperado, and like a wild Indian whom he resembled in his tawny skin and high cheekbones, he seemed to run amuck at heaven and earth. He was a cane afloat, branded on his yellow brow with some inscrutable curse, and going about corrupting and searing every heart that beat near him. And finally, the end. What does it mean to be a believer such as Redburn and to run up against someone who is unquestionably the epitome of evil. Look at this next paragraph. But there seemed even more woe than wickedness about the man. And his wickedness seemed to spring from his woe and for all his hideousness there was that in his eye at times that was ineffably pitiable and touching. And though there were moments when I almost hated this Jackson, yet I have pitied no man as I have pitied him. And so you have this humanity of Redburns coming out and facing this horrible figure, Jackson. Jackson, the devil incarnate. Turn to another description of Jackson. We get some idea of what evil is like. This is before his death. Turn to chapter 
58. This is when people are dying in the plague. There's, the food is out. They're in a storm. There are people dying of fever. On the second day, says Redburn. Do you see where that is? Oh, it's about the middle. On the second day, seven died, one of whom was the little tailor. On the third, four. On the fourth, six, of whom one was the Greenland sailor and another, a woman in the cabin, whose death, however, was afterwards supposed to have been purely induced by her fears. All these people are dying. 500 people in the hold during a storm. No food. These last deaths brought the panic to its height. And sailors, officers, cabin passengers, and immigrants all looked upon each other like lepers. All but the only true leper among us, the mariner Jackson, who seemed elated with the thought that for him, already in the deadly clutches of another disease, no danger was to be apprehended from a fever, which only swept off the comparatively healthy. So here is someone who is dying, who sees no problem with the healthy dying. It's only when you're sick and when you're wicked and when you're inscrutably evil that death has meaning. And then with death comes life, says Redburn. As the dying departed, the places of two of them were filled in the roles of humanity by the birth of two infants whom the plague, pla panic, and gale had hurried into the world before their time. And the babies survive. I want to move to the last of Jackson. This is 59. begins, before the sailors had made fast the reef tackle, and that's the tackle that holds the ropes that uh, are going to enable you to lower the sail so that it doesn't take wind. Before the sailors had made fast the reef tackle, Jackson was tottering up the rigging, thus getting the start of them and securing his place at the extreme weather end of the topsail yard. The topsail yard, you know where the topsail now is, and you know the yardarm that holds the topsail in place. Uh, he was at the extreme weather end of the topsail yard, which in reefing is accounted the post of honor. For it was one of the characteristics of this man that though when on duty he would shy away from mere dull work in a calm, yet in tempest time he always claimed the van and would yield it to none. So he was still powerful, still strong, always influential, and no one could get ahead of him. Soon we were all strung along the main topsail yard. So you've got all these sailors strung up on the main yard. Now remember, this is the main topsail, which is the third sail before you get to the top gallant and the top gallant mainsail. So you're about in the middle on the first mast before the masts are uh, connected. And the ship was rearing and plunging under us like a runaway steed, each man gripping his reef point and sideways leaning, dragging the sail over toward Jackson, whose business it was to confine the reef corner to the yard. So you're trying to reduce the sail and reduce the, uh, the impact of the wind on the ship. His hat and shoes were off and he rode the yard arm end, leaning backward to the gale and pulling at the earring rope like a bridle. At all times, this is a moment of frantic exertion with sailors whose spirits seem then to partake of the commotion of the elements as they hang in the gale 
between heaven and earth. So here is the ultimate moment. Jackson reefing the sail at the end of the yard arm. All things are moving in his direction. He's in charge. Haul to the windward, coughed Jackson with a blasphemous cry. And he threw himself back with a violent strain upon the bridle in his hand. But the wild words were hardly out of his mouth when his hands dropped to his side and the bellying sail was spattered with a torrent of blood from his lungs. As the man next him stretched out his arm to save, Jackson fell headlong from the yard and with a long seethe plunged like a diver into the sea. At this point, normally people would try to stop, but in a storm you can't stop, and Jackson is gone. Says Redbird, indeed upon reflection, it would have been idle to attempt to save Jackson, for besides that he must have been dead ere he struck the sea. And if he had not been dead then, the first immersion must have driven his soul from his lacerated lungs, and we could not have launched our boat in time to get to him. <clears throat> what a terrible storm this is. But there is this catharsis when in the blood, spurting the blood, and almost a cathartic ejaculation of blood, Jefferson falls to his death, and in Jackson's blood, the men feel relieved. If you want to draw religious imagery from that, you can. But don't make the mistake of equating the blood of the cross with the blood of Jackson, because those distinctions are very much, very different and distinct. Judge then says, Redburn, what promise of salvation for us had we shipwrecked? Yet in this state, one merchant ship out of three keeps its boat. He says, we, we, we could as much, we, we could lose. We could go down. We could sink. But there always have to be some survivors, he says. And he quotes from Job. Remember when Job's cattle were carried away by the Sabaeans? And when Job's house collapsed and his children were killed, always one servant comes to tell him the story. And the Bible account says, someone escaped to tell. And here is Redburn recalling Job. For even in the worst of the calamities that befell patient Job, someone, at least of his servants, escaped to report it. I want to comment on some of the other characters because while they're very minor characters, they're really quite important. I think there's a poignant moment in page 172, and let's find that passage on page 172. This is chapter 36. where a sailor comes aboard ship in this case a sailor has died and Redburn finds himself in the basement of the church where there is a dead house you saw in the guidebook a dead house like the morgue in Paris where the bodies of drowned are exposed until claimed by their friends Whenever, says Redburn, I passed up Chapel Street, I used to see a crowd gazing through the grim iron grating of the door upon the faces of the drowned within. And once when the door was opened, I saw a sailor stretched out, stark and stiff, with the sleeve of his frock rolled up and showing his name and date of birth tattooed upon his arm. So his name and date of birth are tattooed on his arm. It was a sight full of suggestions. He seemed his own headstone. 
Now, phrases like that only Melville can write. Sententious, meaningful. The man knew at some point in his death he would not be identified unless he himself wrote it on himself. I wonder what kind of marker there is for your name and birth date in tattoo parlors in Houston. One of the many memorable characters in this book is Betsy Jennings. And we've got to spend some time with Betsy Jennings because she really introduces us to a major theme of this novel. And that is the inhumanity of people toward those who are impoverished and those who are dying. When he comes to Liverpool, young Redburn sees a woman with children in a cellar, almost in a state of death. And that is Betsy Jennings. Turn to chapter 37, what Redburn saw in Lancelot's hay. bottom of page 176 in my book, but in yours, the chapter begins, okay, she has two girls with her, he's trying to get water for these people whom he has left in a basement dying, the woman had uttered something like water, and Redburn has no money. Nevertheless, he takes his tarpaulin hat, fills it with water, and goes back to where he found Betsy Jennings and her children. The two girls drank out of the hat together, looking up at me with an unalterable, idiotic expression that almost made me faint. The woman spoke not a word and did not stir. While the girls were breaking and eating the bread, I tried to lift the woman's head. But feeble as she was, she seemed bent upon holding it down. Observing her arms still clasped upon her bosom and that something seemed hidden under the rags there, a thought crossed my mind which impelled me forcibly to withdraw her hands for a moment. When I caught a glimpse of a meager little babe, the lower part of its body thrust into an old bonnet. Its face was dazzlingly white, even its squalor. But the closed eyes looked like balls of indigo. It must have been dead some hours. The woman refusing to speak, eat, or drink. I asked one of the girls who they were and where they lived, but she only stared vacantly, muttering something that could not be understood. He says, I wish I could either help them or put them out of their misery. He says, I felt an almost irresistible impulse to do them the last mercy, in some way putting an end to their horrible lives. They're starving, they're dying, the baby is already dead, Betsy Jennings is almost dead. The girls are drinking their last drops of water. And I should almost have done so, I think, had I not been deterred by thoughts of the law. He says, I wouldn't have killed them because then I would have been arrested. And then you get this profound statement of how this world is willing to spend its money. And Redburn says this, For I well knew that the law which would let them perish of themselves without giving them one cup of water, would spend a thousand pounds, if necessary, in convicting him who should so much as offer to relieve them of their miserable existence. We'll worry about finding funds for people impoverished, people living under bridges. We have difficulty changing 
finding rooms for people in vacant hotels who otherwise have to sleep under bridges. But if we have to hold a trial that's going to cost $3 million, we don't seem to have a problem doing that. And here is Melville commenting about this intractable world that allows people to starve even while passers-by ignore them and know that they're there starving and fail to provide them any relief. The story of Bessie Jennings and the story of the poverty in this novel becomes a, an essential, uh, become essential themes and motifs as we move through uh, Redburn. Give me just one moment. I'm looking for one comment here which gives us some sense of what's happening. Oh, here it is. <laughs> right in front of me. All right, let's go back to page 194. And that's chapter 60. 61, where Melville has Redburn describing the poverty that he has experienced. This happens to be in London. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, this is still in Liverpool, and let's look at what he says. Often I witnessed some curious and many very sad scenes. And especially I remembered encountering a pale, ragged man rushing along frantically and striving to throw off his wife and children who clung to his arms and legs. And in God's name conjured him not to desert them. So here we have a situation of a man abandoning his family he seemed bent upon rushing down to the water and drowning himself in some despair and craziness of wretchedness. In these hunts, beggary went on before me wherever I walked and dogged me unceasingly at the heels. Poverty, poverty, poverty. In almost endless vistas and want and woe staggered arm in arm along these miserable streets. Now, in the same chapter, there's an interesting contrast. And we can leave this discussion of the characters that we've been following and studying, this cornucopia of characters, memorable characters, even those with one sentence, the man who is his own headstone. Because Melville, in this same page, introduces us to another situation. And that is his concern with the issue of slavery, which is part of Redburn. He sees black men in England, and he sees them walking about not as slaves, but as free men. And on page, on the same page that you've been looking at, which is what? Are you in chapter 60 or 61? I'm in 61. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. No, I'm in 41. Go to 41. 40. Yeah. I was, I don't, a, uh, I'm sorry, it's 41. I don't s suffer from reversals, but I did here. Where he's discussing poverty in Liverpool, he suddenly sees blacks walking around free. And he says this, Speaking of Negroes, recalls the looks of interest with which Negro sailors are regarded when they walk the Liverpool streets. In Liverpool, indeed, the Negro steps with a prouder pace and lifts his head like a man. For here, 
No such exaggerated feeling exists in respect to him as in America. Three or four times I encountered our black steward, dressed very handsomely and walking arm in arm with a good-looking English woman. In New York, such a couple would have been mobbed in three minutes and the steward would have been lucky to escape with whole limbs. Owing to the friendly reception extended to them and the unwanted immunities they enjoy in Liverpool, the black cooks and stewards of American ships are very much attached to the place and like to make voyages to it. Now, in light of this particular discussion, we do have that statement a little further on, where seeing the way people are treated equally in Liverpool and in England, Melville makes this statement, or Redburn makes this statement, but it's really Melville talking. He says, at first I was surprised. This is the paragraph that begins being so young. About two sentences down. What page is that on? 277. He says, being so young and inexperienced then and unconsciously swayed in some degree by those local and social prejudices that are the marring of most men. At first I was surprised that a colored man should be treated as he is in this town. But a little reflection showed that after all, it was but recognizing his claims to humanity and normal equality. So that in some things, we Americans leave to other countries the carrying out of the principle that stands at the head of our Declaration of Independence. So I'd like to spend a few moments before we move into some of the basic aspects of Redburn and looking at Melville the abolitionist. Now, a lot of his statements are not statements that really deal with the slave trade, but they're related because he draws analogies which are really quite important. He says, for example, and you can turn to chapter 13. He says, and it's the very last, chapter, the very last paragraph in chapter 13. He says, A miserable dog's life is this of the sea, commanded like a slave, and set to work like an ass. Vulgar and brutal men lording it over me as if I were an African in Alabama. So here he is, a sailor, Redburn, thinking that he would be greeted by Captain Riga and treated like one of the family, even allowed to dine at the captain's table like a gentleman. <laughs> He's soon disabused of that option. But here he is making the analogy of the way people are treated. Go now to chapter 18, where we describe, in, we discover in Liverpool a black woman by the name of Desquak, who is a fortune teller. She's, pardon me, 134, 144. This is right after his discussion of the wealth of nations. We find out that one of the sailors tells us of his interviews in Liverpool with a fortune teller, an old Negro woman with, by the name of Desquak, whose house was much frequented by sailors, and how she had two black cats with remarkably green eyes and nightcaps on their heads solemnly seated on a claw-footed table near the old goblin when she felt his pulse to tell what was going to befall him. So here we have a woman, independent, 
earning a living, influencing the sailors, and being part of their experience. He mentions on page 149, and the chapter is chapter 31. He's looking at statuary. He's visiting various sites. In, in Liverpool, and he sees a statuary in bronze. This is, the paragraph begins, the ornament in question is a group of statuary in bronze elevated upon a marble pedestal and basement representing Lord Nelson expiring in the arms of victory. One foot rests on a rolling foe and the other on a cannon. Victory is dropping a wreath on the dying admiral's brow. This is a sculpture. Someone has died. Are there any sculptures in this class? Anyone who would understand the difficulty in creating this out of stone? One foot rests on a rolling foe and the other on a cannon. Victory is dropping a wreath on the dying admiral's brow while death under the similitude of a hideous skeleton is insinuate, insinuating his bony hand under the hero's robe and groping after his heart. A very striking design. and True to the imagination, I never could look at death without a shudder, he says. But now what else is on this pedestal with Lord Nelson dying above it? At uniform intervals around the base of the pedestal, Four naked figures in chains, somewhat larger than life, are seated in various attitudes of humiliation and despair. One has his leg recklessly thrown over his knee, and his head bowed over as if he had given up all hope of ever feeling better. Another has his head buried in despondency, and no doubt looks mournfully out of his eyes. But as his face was averted at the time, I could not catch the expression. These woe-begone figures of captives are emblematic of Nelson's principal victories, each one representing a battle in which he had defeated a nation or defeated a navy. But, says Melville, or Redburn, speaking as the persona for Melville, but I never could look at their swarthy limbs and manacles without being involuntarily reminded of four African slaves in the marketplace. He sees many different types of ships coming into port. One is a normal sloop. Another is a ship he calls a French hermaphrodite. Now, Interestingly enough, there is such a ship as a French hermaphrodite. Uh, it looks like a brig. Remember, I showed you, <coughs> I showed you before, that the brig could have your foresail, your mainsail, and your mizzen, and the sails would be somewhat like that. But in the Hermaphrodite is your jib. The sails actually have more of a triangulation, but it's actually an actual ship. So when he speaks about a French hermaphrodite, he's not making comments about French sexuality. Um, he's really talking about a ship which may have been named for that reason, but that's not the reason he's describing it. And then we've already mentioned about how Negro sailors are treated in Liverpool. When he talks about 
on the return trip from London. Let me get the pad again, please. Sorry. On the return trip from London, we discover that 500 immigrants are put on the ship, crowded into a hold. The travel agents, or the people who told them that they would have an easy trip overseas from London to America, told them that they only had to take 20 days of food because that's how long the trip would take. And we discover in reading Redburn that most of these trips may take 40 to 60 days. So by the time the 20th day has run, off, uh, run past, a great many of the people have already eaten all their food. And then the captain has to ration food to them, one biscuit, one cup of water a day, so that they can survive the trip. It becomes a fight amongst the immigrants. Who has some food? Who has preserved his food? Who is able to survive? And of course, who will die? But the, once the food runs out, and once the storm comes up and it's impossible to cook one's food on the open range out on the deck, then we have examples of people growing sick, growing feverish, and dying and the whole episode of the storm and the episode of the famine on the ship is a striking example of the way that these immigrants have been exploited. We do know that after Redburn, laws were being passed to restrict, and Melville even says in this book, that there should be laws to restrict the number of passengers, to inform them of the real hazards of the voyage, to ensure that they bring on enough food with them and enough so that they will go on the, uh, enough goods so that they can survive the trip. But at the point when the people are packed in, they're forced all to stay under, uh, uh, <clears throat> within the hold of the ship during the storm, Redburn says, these are all friendless immigrants, stowed away like bales of cotton, and packed like slaves in a slave ship. Remember, this is 1849. I think 1850 is yet to have the Nebraska-Kansas uh, debacle. Melville, who is among the abolitionists, contesting the existence of slavery in America and the continuance of slavery, finds enough situations and sufficient circumstances to bring up the subject over and over and over again. As the people begin to suffer famine, death, fever, typhoid, they begin to worry about other things. They begin to fantasize about what the future is. They, they assume that they will never even, ever get to America. And the rumor goes around even that the immigrants are going to be taken to the Barbary Coast and sold into slavery. Of course, the issue, the, the claim is unfounded. But enough people believe it, that it heightens their, their fear. As you read Melville and you move from moments of bliss to moments of human despoilation, human suffering, poverty, death, famine, on shore and on ship, you see that Melville's Redburn is simply not the story of a boy's adventure at sea. It's really an adventure of what it takes to survive in this world. Now, there are some other issues I'd like to focus on at this point. And one of the issues I intend to focus on is the longitudinal development of Redburn's existence. He goes from innocence to experience. And so I'm going to spend a few moments talking about Redburn's life in this respect. Give me a moment to pull 
out this discussion. There is, we know, a mixture of fact and fiction in Redburn. It's apparent from his first three novels that actual persons who sailed with Melville on the St. Lawrence are transformed in, in this novel. The plague sequence was emphasized to protest inhumanity on the high seas. And if it may be proven that Melville searches his own experiences, we may discover how a writer takes autobiographical detail and turns it into a work of fiction that expands, the first extrapolates from experience, but then expands to a universal understanding so that this doesn't become just the adventure of a young boy gone to sea, but it becomes the experience of every man. We began the course by talking about Pilgrim's Progress. Well, to some extent, Redburn is a pilgrim, and let's see how, the, how it works. Redburn's life on ship begins with his selection of a bunk formerly occupied by a suicide. The drunk had been carried on board without awakening. And leaping from his bunk in a frenzy, which Redburn identified as the DTs, the man dives overboard to his death. Now this is a little better situation than later on when we discover that a drunk is brought on ship. We assume he's drunk. But after a couple days of his not reviving from this drunken stupor, the man actually discovered that he is dead. And the truth of the matter is, apparently, that a sailor brought him on board and received funds for having brought a body on board to man the ship. So a great deal of fraud was involved in bringing a dead sailor on ship who then lay on a bunk for two days without anyone knowing he was dead. But as Max comes down and begins to look at the sailor, Flames shoot out of his mouth, from his eyes, and the body seems responsive to what the period was very much interested in, spontaneous combustion. Dickens mentions spontaneous combustion, Bleak House, and a, uh, um, Caleb Williams, an early American novel, mentions spontaneous combustion. And here we have the man's body burning by some ineffable flame. And of course, they have to remove it and throw it overboard. But, it, but, but Redburn, when he comes on the ship, discovers that he has to take off the bunk of someone who has jumped out. Now, to the extent that someone has died and he has replaced him, remember the story that Melville tells us later on during the plague on the ship, when some people died, but two babes were born. Well, this adumbrates the situation, this anticipates that situation, where one man dies and Redburn comes on board. Now he's the child, he's the babe, he's the innocent coming into a world, and the world is the ship. So the ship becomes a microcosm of the world, and Melville becomes a new babe who inhabits the world for the first time. Redburn then replaces the man, the drunken man, the man who suffered DTs in the forecastle, an innocent youth, a striking contrast to the depraved sailor who is lost. Remember, Redburn says he belonged to a teenage group that protested drinking. He was a very good boy when he was younger. This phoenix has little chance to display his regenerative spirit. <coughs> 
led by Jackson, the crew threatens Redburn with violence, laughs at his genteel background, degrades his experience, and the reality of the ship contrasts with the dream world he's left behind. And Redburn says, it was not altogether my own good endeavor so much as my education, which I had received from others that made me the upright and sensible boy I at that time thought myself to be. Now, Melville's images consist consistently convey the picture of Redburn as an infant. Taunted by sailors, Redburn retires to a chest with his face bent over his knees between his hands. So he takes on the fetal position. There's the baby in the womb, and the ship is the rocking womb, but he's not protected by any mother as the sailors are after him. The fetus there sat till at length the dull beating against the ship's bowels and the silence around soothed him down and he fell asleep as he sat. So there you've got the youngster in the amniotic fluid, you see, the ship's rolling motion gives him a sense of security. The next morning, however, he joins the sailors on deck just before the work of, is about to begin and he, he sees them half asleep. He says, till at last they fell off like little boys at church in a drowsy sermon. The analogy momentarily suspends the sadistic nature of these sailors. <laughs> and we know that they are being ministered to by their father, who is Captain Riga, who is really quite harsh. Now, Redburn's initiation to the work of the crew is equivalent to a baptismal ceremony. He shies away from scrubbing the deck. He complains he's going to get water on his feet. The bait forces him to submit under threat of, uh, under <coughs> threat of punishment more fearsome than his aunt's consumption. Now, Redburn says, I who had to trot after him with the buckets, had no more legs and arms than I wanted for my own use. And babies, of course, don't know how to use their legs and arms yet. And so we have the analogy where Redburn is put in this uncompromising position where he's just a child. He remains in the crawling stage. He can't trot. Now, once he's finished with this episode, he has to learn to eat, right? He, now, he must learn to use his arms. He must learn to use his legs. Now he must learn to eat. By the way, we've already, already mentioned that he has to learn language. He has to learn to use his arms and legs. He has to learn language. He has to learn that pegs are plugs. He has to know what a yard arm is. He has to know what a top gallon sail is. He must know what a stay for sail is. He's got to learn. And now he wants to eat. Now how does a child eat? Redburn comes to the forecastle for his share of the burgoo, a food compost, somewhat like a breakfast. It was made of Indian corn and water mixed with molasses to give it consistency. In other words, you're celebrating the god Ceres. The god Ceres is the god of cereal, right? And corn and grain. That's why we eat cereal in the morning. Every morning you pay obedience to this God series, if you like cereal. If you don't like cereal, then go back to bagels and cream cheese. <laughs> now he wants to eat. He becomes a little fellow in the litter, the youngest member of the family, but he hasn't learned to command a seat at the table. And he suffers his greatest embarrassment when he discovers that in, he doesn't have a spoon. So he takes a stick and puts it in the burgoo in order to get enough cereal that he can eat it. Well, what does a father do when a youngster puts his hands in the food? 
in this case, uh, Redburn gets his first lesson in table manners when one sailor knocks the stick from his mouth as he's about to taste the food. We don't know who that sailor is. It heightens the shame. It doesn't matter. Any big brother, any disciplinarian at the table would discipline a child who doesn't act right at the table. From the masses steps a tutor whose response is society's reproach to the unlearned. And when Redburn does find a utensil that he can use, that he can eat, and he gets back, what happens to him? There's none left. The food remaining on the kid is on the opposite side from his side. Redburn has a lot of other lessons to learn. And again, it's part of this longitudinal growth. You've got to learn to act how to act, you've got to learn how to speak, you've got to learn how to move. As articulate as he may seem as the narrator of the story, there's nothing wrong with his ability, nor with what he reads, but the child has to learn the language of the sailor. The language barrier stands between him and the mate in the baptismal scene, where he learns that land pails are not pails, but buckets. Pegs are plugs. And Redburn says this, he says, The mate ordered me to do a great many simple things, none of which I could comprehend owing to the queer words he used. I had a student once who said, I'm going to have to drop your class, Dr. Roth. And I said, why? He says, I can't understand any of those words you're using. I said, well, I'm, I said, there are only 26 letters in the English alphabet. And any way you put them together, you should learn to understand them. But he stayed. I told him to buy six weeks to words of power and develop his vocabulary and do some other things. But the truth of the matter is you do learn different languages. And we all learn different languages. That is, when we are four years old or five years old, we know about 4,000 words. The average person doesn't add but more than about 7,000 words to his vocabulary. You do become particularly, you become an engineer, you become aware of physical terms, technical terms, manip manipulative terms. If you study chemistry, you learn you learn formulas and equations. <laughs> Translated from chemical terms, <laughs> right, right. When you enter, enter psychology, you learn such words as id and ego and superego and have to discover what those terms mean. When you enter education, you learn that you can take compound wor words of compound meaning and make them singular and then pluralize them, like learning. There are multiple learnings that occur. And you say, well, that's jargon. But it's the language of certain educators in our business. And so when you walk into a meeting and they talk about the learnings that will occur, you can either ridicule them or you can go along and earn your paycheck. <laughs> We're always learning new vocabulary. The dialectic on language progresses from the literal sense of words to allegorical recognition. Pressured by colleagues who represent the cultural community, Redburn has to develop a workable vocabulary. Mastery of the language depends on the modification of sounds. Redburn compares his experience on ship to his visiting, and this is a quote from the book, a barbarous country where they speak a strange dialect and dress in strange clothes and live in strange houses. And this is part, this is no different than Gulliver in Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver does the same thing. When he comes to a new country, he must learn the language. He must learn the social customs. He must learn how to engage in speech with 
the Lilliputians with a Brobding Nagian uh, king and with the winning and master. He's got to learn to talk to horses and then he's got to learn to talk to scientists. At times, Redburn does identify himself with the crew as he learns their language and their dialect. He refines his own to conform to theirs. And the tone of personal narrative where he's talking about his own life shifts to that of someone who has the rhetoric and the language and he can go from the literal to the symbolic. Melville achieves this transition when Redburn compares a ship to a human body. He says, for the moment, the lines, such as the starboard main top gallant bowline, remember that's the starboard side of the ship, and the line that goes to the main top gallant sail, at least the fourth sail up, and then is attached to the bowline. So we find is his, is his knowledge at this point that he suggests a categorization of names and titles to correspond to the infinite terms assigned to the parts of the human body. Something like a ship, he says. Its bones being the stiff standing rigging and the sinews, the small ropes, that manage all the motions. So your sinews are like bowlines and your veins are moving up to the top gallon sail. And so the body is like a ship. And these analogies can be made until one becomes familiar with a language that allows one then to move into an allegorical context. Redburn draws a broader significance. He recognizes in every mast and timber a pulse that was beating with life and joy, the breath of life which gives life to man and beast, so that these, these masts are not simply pieces of wood. Remember that they are moving. They have to have a certain flexibility. They have to be held in place and they can and, and the yard arm can be turned and the skin can be lifted reefed or it can be lowered until it's bellying out in full sail the names of the ship give us a sense of body and that's what Melville does here the development of Redburn's language is the token by which the reader recognizes his maturing personality. Redburn appears on ship as an infant whose life is shaped by experience. He is an innocent abroad. And once he understands language, he perceives the evil that permeates the crew in the character of Jackson. In his innocent state, unsullied by the world, Redburn achieves an unpredictable empathy with his tormentor. He states, for all his hideousness, he was ineffably pitiable and touching. And though there were moments when I hated Jackson, yet I have pitied him. Apart from the unrelenting opinion of the reader, Redburn stands alone envisioning mystical truth. Redburn's assessment of Jackson is the synthesis of the narrator. And it's the hero at which, it's, it's the heroic point at which his self-consciousness becomes his identification with all human beings. If indeed Jackson is the symbol of evil. Redburn has enough humanity in him to realize that all men in this world are created as part of the world. They're not separate from it. 
There's nothing that removes Jackson from the world other than his sense of evil and the terror he inspires in other people, but he's still a human being. And one of the characteristics is that while you have this distinct differentiation between the humanity of Redburn and the sinfulness of Jackson, they're on the same ship, in the same hold, in the same world, common to each other and affecting each other. This is the sense of humanity that we find. Redburn finds in the character of Jackson more woe than wickedness, and his wickedness springs from woe. It is this relationship between Redburn and Jackson that proves the value of the voyage. It suggests that the boy who slept in place of the dead man has passed through the difficulty of these infantile neuroses, and he's now ready to take his place among men. None of the sailors but Redburn recognizes the deep scar that sears Jackson's soul. He seemed to run amuck at heaven and earth to prove that nothing was to be believed. Now the power that Jackson holds over the sailors is an incurable malady eating up his vitals. In contrast, Redburn was young and handsome. And this is one of the things that Jackson hated in him. Jackson, mean-spirited, venal, without hope, saw what he had lost when he looked at Redburn. He wouldn't have killed Redburn. He wouldn't have murdered him because if you want to try to draw an analogy and a metaphorical analogy, Redburn's the alter ego. Redburn's what evil, Redburn's the innocence that evil has lost. And Redburn survives because, <coughs> <coughs> among other things, Melville is the survivor. Jackson's death rings for each sailor. If he dies and their sins are purged in his death, he is their salvation. If he dies and they are to follow, he leaves his mark. But if, if he dies and he relieves them of this evil in their presence, then they haven't They have shared his suffering only to the extent that they've been able to separate themselves from it and keep themselves from him. He becomes the exemplar of evil that they can avoid. So if the books in Redburn teach us any lessons, then the life experience that one encounters by meeting such as Jackson also becomes a learning experience, a book experience. According to Freud, instincts are manifested in pairs of opposites. Instincts are manifested in pairs of opposites. The great hold that evil may have over goodness is the very fact that there is ambivalence. There is neither all good nor all evil. Each man senses in Jackson his own evil deeds. And however impossible to prove in the text of Melville's Redburn, there is that pity for Jackson that suggests that he is part of the human condition. He's not a figure you can throw away, nor is his dying a throw away. His dying is a fate, is his fate. Every man from the captain to the child in the steerage sees the fall, and some were spotted with the blood that trickled from the sail. But more than anything, the novel gives, delivers a new reaction among the men. 
They're released from the oppression they felt under death's power. Later on, <coughs> when they make an obscene gesture toward Captain Riga, they're also relieved of the oppression of his authority. Among other messages that Redburn may deliver is the freedom of conscience and the freedom of action that all men must own themselves, the responsibilities they must own for themselves, and furthermore, to extend the analogy, Redburn was also telling the nation that all men must achieve freedom and the opportunity to be free, including the slaves in America at the time. We'll spend a little bit more time with Redburn next time, but I think the total lecture for the next two weeks will deal with Kafka's Kessel. And I'm inclined rather than to try to deal with any new novel in a given evening because of the nature of these courses, simply to deal with a single novel each week, although Kafka will take us two weeks. So I want to thank you again for being with us this evening. Those of you who are in the studio, the many of you sitting at West Houston and North Houston, <laughs> trying to find a place at those tables amongst the <laughs> minions who are there with you, and all of you who are watching on TV. And the, young, the woman at Office Max who saw me and said, she saw me on television and wanted to know about something I'd said. I'm sorry that I forgot to ask you your name. Have a good week.